Hey guys, I'm Joel, and this is Crypto Tech Solutions. All right, welcome back for another episode of Crypto Tech Solutions. Today is Friday, March the 17th, 2017. And today I've got a very special guest, Todd Weaver from Purism. He's the CEO and founder, and uh, he's gonna be talking today about the Vault 7 leaks and how his company, Purism, is attempting to address that issue on the device and hardware side. Now, according to Todd's bio, he's got more than 20 years as a serial entrepreneur and a promoter of free and open source software. But before we get to today's interview, let's have a word from our sponsor. Proton Mail is one of my absolute favorite services on the internet. They don't scan your emails for advertisers like Gmail, and they can't be hacked like Yahoo. How do I know this? Because Proton Mail is end to end encrypted, so that at no time are the contents of your email ever exposed. Only you hold the encryption key. So Proton Mail couldn't read your email even if they wanted to. I personally subscribe to their Proton Mail Plus service, which is five euros per month or five dollars thirty cents US. It's great, easy to use, and I feel good knowing that I'm supporting a solid company that actually protects my privacy. I could never go back to using an in secure email service again. All right. Welcome to the show, Todd. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. For, thanks for being here. So uh, I've already, like I said just a moment ago, I've already introduced you to our audience. But if you could, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and about your background? Sure. Yeah. Um, my background's from uh, technology, uh, both hardware and software. So I've been a um, hardware architect uh, and software architect or CTO for a number of companies. The um, largest company I've worked for was Amazon. I was a contractor there for a short bit. I think I've heard and, of them. Yeah, exactly. And then I, I uh, left that place and then was a CTO of a digital media company where we actually produced hardware and software. So I wrote all the um, entire distribution, which was a Debian-based distribution. And then I ended up um, becoming a uh, uh, hardware and software architect for a company called Play Network. And that's if you go into any... Uh, Starbucks or any retail store and you hear the music overhead, that's hardware I uh, designed, manufactured, and all of the software that I wrote uh, runs on those devices. And they, they probably manufactured about 100,000 a year of uh, those units. Um, then I actually started up an online cable company, uh, the first online cable company in about 2007, uh, where we were streaming broadcast television to over the internet. Um, for four dollars and ninety cents a month, we were paying royalties to the broadcasters, but that of course didn't stop them from wanting to sue us to oblivion. So that's exactly what happened. Uh, so we, we ran, we operated about eighteen months, um, and then uh, and then our case ended up going to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. We lost on appeal, petitioned the Supreme Court, and they didn't hear our case. So we basically settled um, to say that okay, fine, uh, we lose. I'm very. We were, we were technically right on the law, so it was kind of a. Uh, it was just that you know they were too big and we were too small. So at that point, then I uh, really kind of wanted to focus back on hardware, software, looking at you know what options we have, um, and uh, and then really, a uh, thing that's been bothering me for decades has been basically hardware uh, bundled with software that really supports the free software movement or really what those beliefs are which, as it relates to security, privacy, and freedom. And so then I ran a crowdfunding campaign to say, are other people interested if we end up manufacturing hardware and put up the software behind it? Uh, and, um, and there was an overwhelming response for us to, to do just that, really make it a convenient, elegant, high class, you know, high end uh, bundle. And so that's really what started Purism. Uh, you know, my, my uh, you know, personal life, I guess I've been a you know computer geek for, you know, going on about 25 years uh, and really been a free software supporter since, uh, you know, the about 1990, uh, 1992 uh, was when I first started to get into, you know, comparing basically Solaris versus uh, running a GNU Linux stack and clearly decided on GNU Linux 
mostly because of the cost reasons at the time. Uh, but then, you know, from there it kind of expanded and my, you know, love for the space is, uh, has, you know, grown stronger. Excellent. Thank you. Um, it's funny before the show, we were talking and how it's a small world and, uh, how people paths cross. I was actually a customer of the, uh, the antenna broadcast over the internet, um, service that you were talking about and i was really sad when it went away so that's crazy yeah right it's, yeah yeah that's uh right there's a fair number of people and I've, and one of the things that really is crazy about um about that whole thing is that we actually did a really deep dive on the on the legal side of things and really the the short way to describe it is that broadcast television initially started as over the air broadcast and then when cable started, they said, hey, this is just, it's free, it's over the air, so we should just be able to redistribute it to people like in a valley who mm -hmm. don't have the ability to receive broadcast signal. And so in that case, actually, was the, those cable companies were sued by broadcasters. And then the cable companies um, uh, ended up going, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, this is actually just over the air, so they shouldn't have to pay. Then the copyright law changed to say, well, that's, we need to compensate the content owners, right? The copyright uh, holders. And so what they ended up doing was um, establishing, changing the copyright law that says you can re you can retransmit as long as you charge a fee and you pay the broadcasters a royalty. And that's exactly the law that we were doing because that's the same thing as cable companies do today. And we paid the same rate that cable companies do today, uh, but it, um, it just was seen as you know, it was just too new. It was a too new of a technology at the time. Uh, but it was, um, and at that time, I actually said it was 2007. They said it would be over 10 years before you start seeing broadcast television carried live over the internet. And we're still not quite there. But um, anyway, it's it's a it was it was fun while it lasted. All right, yeah, I didn't mean to get you sidetracked, but it was a great product, and I was sorry to see it go. All right, but we're here to talk about purism. Um, obviously, I'm blogging about digital privacy and security, and that's where our interests overlap. overlap. And so you talked about the start of purism, but um, before we kind of get into your products, would you talk a little bit more about what purism's ethics are in this space and how you see purism as a, a solution to digital privacy and security versus the model that is kind of ubiquitous, ubiquitous today. Yeah, so there's a, a lot to talk about, and that's in that because it it really is the way I describe it is how deep you go. And so you know, literally with every single threat that we hear on a daily basis, um, what what you end up having to realize is the threats are so far and wide that it, it becomes a game of depth for security. So th this is an example to where, um, or even we post on our blog, you know, the ways in which you can determine your depth of security, um, especially as it relates to the most recent Vault 7 um, leaks, where um, if somebody were to come and ask me, right, you know, hey, how, how do I crack, uh, you know, encrypted communication technologies, uh, it would be a simple answer of, you know, like let's say WhatsApp or, you know, or, uh, um, signal or you know the list of uh, encrypted communication technologies is that if you just go a layer lower then you own if you own the operating system you own everything that goes above it um, and so and that what was fascinating in the vault 7 is that there was proof positive that the CIA and other nation states and even bad hackers and then also those who have access to that code take that exact philosophy which is you know their approach is the encryption is good so let's just go a layer lower and we can own the, the you know iOS or Android devices in that case, uh, which means then they own the apps. So one of the things in, and really behind the philosophy, which is one of your questions about purism, was that we uh, understand that depth of security is is critical, and the only business model and long term philosophy is to uh, have the entire stack available for audit and in users control. So that would mean where our long-term goal is to actually have when, when somebody's buying a Purism device that they can encrypt with their own keys their device and sign all of the entire software stack. So that means that uh, even you know we as a manufacturer have no control, right? And, and this touches on a number of other topics that we can get into, like Apple versus FBI, 
uh, in fact that you don't actually own your Apple phone, that the warrant should have gone to the person rather than to Apple, and that's proof positive that Apple actually owns the device. Um, so if we were to get a warrant for a, you know somebody's laptop, we have no control over it, right? So hmm. we, we have, we wouldn't get the warrant because we can't actually issue anything that would help any type of law enforcement. So those types of things end up making it where a philosophy that is around the Free Software Foundation's you know, beliefs of full transparency, right? Having the software in the control of the users, the four essential freedoms, all end up bolstering the security and privacy for users. And really at the end of the day, for me, it's about having users control their device as opposed to manufacturers, governments, uh, large corporations, you know, uh, spying agencies, corporate surveillance organizations, etc. Absolutely. Um, I've been following you guys for, I'd say, six to nine months now, and I hadn't pulled the trigger on buying a Purism laptop yet. And then it was actually your blog post on Vault 7 that kind of brought you guys back to my attention again and made me want to reach out to you for an interview. So, uh, excellent post. Thank you for writing that. I shared it with all my uh, Twitter followers and I'll definitely be posting that on today's show notes page again. Um, so with that, what products do you, does Purism have on the market and what specific design elements have you put in to address some of these concerns? Uh, so it's a great question. And so we have a 13 inch laptop that we actually have just placed in order to be able to ship from inventory. So in the past, when we first started, we were actually doing build to order. So that would be where somebody could wait three months, even sometimes even a year, uh, depending on the configuration. And so, uh, but now we've sort of, we've grown to the point where we actually have been able to place an order to be able to ship from inventory for our 13 inch products. That's the Librem 13. And then we also have a 15 inch uh, laptop, a Librem 15, um, that we're placing an order to ship in the next revision to be able to ship from inventory. And that means then the lead time starting around May is gonna be uh, less than a week, which is mm. gonna be fantastic for us to grow and be able to actually even target larger businesses that are concerned about security. Then uh, we also have a Librem 11, which is a, a convertible, right, two-in-one detachable tablet. Um, that product's in pre-order because we haven't actually placed the, the complete inventory uh, order for that product. Uh, then we're going to be designing and manufacturing a phone um, we're probably going to put that campaign out in for probably about September timeframe of this year, which would then be manufactured probably Q2 of 2018. Um, and there's actually a lot of development effort that needs to go behind actually creating a phone that, that meets our standards. So um, the, your question about really what does that entail um, is that we uh, look at all the threats that are, are out there and try to address those at the hardware and the software level. So in the hardware level, we actually have hardware kill switches that phys physically sever the circuit for the webcam and microphone, and then also the Bluetooth and wireless. So there's two separate hardware kill switches. That means that when you turn them off, it's actually cutting the circuit. So there's no way for a malicious software to end up even noticing that there's those devices on the system. I love uh, that feature. Right, and then we also go, uh, you know, in manufacturing, we select chips that don't require any uh, firmware to uh, binary blobs, right, mystery code uh, in the kernel, the operating system, or any of the software that we load. So by doing that, what we, uh, what we can ensure is that it's the source code can be verified, it can operate in the user's best interest, and then the user can actually have control of that, of the, of the overall system. And one of the things we also recently uh, uh, released is we ran we got core boot to run on our um, on our laptops and then we also um, have leveraged what's called ME cleaner which mm -hmm. we, means we've neutralized with Intel management engine uh, which is a basically a separate processor and separate uh, binary that's uh, digitally signed by Intel and so by removing the network stack and the kernel from the Intel management engine we've pretty much neutralized that there's still a few more things we want to do to free that, and then we'll have a completely uh, freed system all the way down. As like I said, the depth for us is, you know, web apps we're completely freed, applications, operating system, kernel, bootloader are all completely free. The BIOS is running Core Boot, which is 
you know, a free BIOS, but it does include some binaries. So we go about six levels deep, uh, six levels deeper than any other hardware manufacturer. I mean, you're not going to find Apple or Google or Dell or Acer um, producing anything even close to that. Yeah, you're also not going to find any of those companies posting on their website where they source all of their hardware from and what input they've had into that. Uh, I thought that was a really nice touch on your guys' website. Um, yes, and I've never yeah. seen... I've never seen a hardware manufacturer's website that had the word uh, privacy, security, and freedom so often. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's right. Well, obviously, that's that's sort of a, you know, we sort of march to that drumbeat uh, and we try to repeat it as much as we can. Uh, and, and also the aspect of manufacturing. So being a small you know, organization, what we've done since I've had history of manufacturing hardware, uh, manufacturing hardware out of China, bringing it to the U.S. and doing all the assembly that we do the same thing for Purism, uh, meaning we manufacture the component parts, uh, ship them all to South San Francisco, where then we do all of the assembly uh, and do the operating system loading, right? Uh, memory configuration, storage, um, and then we uh, are actually gonna also add what's called inter anti-interdiction support, mm. which would mean that we can actually uh, bag the device and uniquely seal it and then post that uh, photo for the order um, so then a customer can see that when they receive the product, it hasn't been tampered with since we've shipped it. Um, but one of the things that I do feel like it helps in, po in posting, uh, you know, what things we have, what things we source, what things we manufacture, and what things we can modify from the, uh, you know, from an original design. And then that allows, uh, you know, just some transparency as, to po as, you know, how we can actually do this. And then one of the things that as we grow, uh, it's an important thing to know is as we grow, because we have a business model behind it, then we can take the funds that we have to leverage uh, additional growth in the supply chain or additional change in the supply chain. So a couple of points on that is uh, we actually just became what's called a social purposes corporation. Mm -hmm. So that's basically in between a nonprofit and a for-profit. Um, and what that means is that we, in our articles of incorporation, we've actually pinned our beliefs in there, which is about privacy, security, and freedom. So by becoming an SPC, or a Social Purposes Corporation, then that uh, enshrines our entire articles of incorporation that they ha we have to release our source code. We, um, you know, when we, if we author the hardware, then we also can release the um, schematics for that hardware design. So those are a number of great things that end up meaning that as we grow and can push in the supply chain, then we can uh, have money and leverage with the supply chain, which the free software movement has never had. And that's that's going to be really helpful for the entire future of secure computing. Yeah, I think you guys are, are definitely doing it right. Um, I think it's amazing that the corporate world hasn't gone after uh, the free and open source kind of software movement in a stronger fashion. I think that your guys... Tar you targeting um, businesses is is really smart because why would you want to keep paying that license fee to Microsoft um, when you can have a product that you know is more secure? It's being uh, backed up by a company like Purism, and um, and has has people all over the world developing on it. So anyway, I think you guys are totally on the right track here. Um, but you're not just a hardware company, right? Um, you, what operating system do your laptops run? Right, so we actually uh, fork from Debian and we run our own Pure OS. And really the reason for that is because um, similar to uh, Apple where they bundle together hardware and software, mm -hmm. of course their approach is you know, to have it be really great looking products. Um, and in our case, we want to focus on all the things that is done there, which is bundling hardware and software into a convenient package that's also high-end, very good-looking products. But by focusing on privacy and security and freedom for users, then we have a reason why people want to buy from us, meaning that they can vote with their dollars, right? So they can actually come and say, you know what, I want to support a company who, when I, when I buy the product, I'm supporting a belief system that I have long-term. And then that means that then we can run and improve Pure OS, which is the operating system that we bundle together with our hardware. And so Pure OS, we actually are submitting that to Free Software Foundation for endorsement. 
because we don't have any binaries. There's no mystery code in any of the entire distribution. And we recommend free software tools over uh, any proprietary tools. Um, so when you actually open up your laptop and you turn it on for the first time, you are installing and actually encrypting your drive with the passphrase that you have. So we actually format the drive and put the little ISO image on the end. Um, and so you actually are going to be the, you're the very first person to write to the drive and, and type in your password. And all of the software you have in there is going to be completely free software that respects all of your freedoms as well as the, um, uh, you know, it's the most secure because, of course, the COVID can be audited. And then we end up improving things. So as an example, just um, we just added a, a GR security based kernel. Mm. So um, going forward, right, we're going to be able to, by default, have a GR security patched kernel for our hardware. And then we can start really pinning down the um, most secure options by default for customers uh, because they can, um, uh, because we ship it by default that way. Fantastic. Um, so you talked about our roadmap with event, you know, developing a phone, which is not too far off in the, in the future. What OS will that run? That'll run pure OS as well um, because we're going to run, um, well, most likely we're going to run GNOME Touch. Mm -hmm. um, but we've sort of looked at a few other options, but that's most likely what, what it'll be. Uh, and we've toyed around with, right, uh, we've run surveys, we've toyed around with what the, you know, we've done a lot of research on the hardware side of things. Um, as it stands right now, because of our advancements with, um, with Core Boot, with the, the, able, the ability to remove some of these binaries from this core that we don't even use, the R core, uh, that we're probably actually going to utilize uh, an Intel-based phone. We've also looked at IMX6, which is basically a great, from freedom standpoint, but it's just so underpowered mm. that um, that the it would we'd relegate ourselves to a very small section of, of who would want to use that product. So those are some things we're toying with. We've done, you know, and and so the stage we're at now, we've done all the research, and now we're going to take that shopping list. To uh, to different manufacturers in uh, Dongguang, China, and see you know what their capabilities are, um, and then then we'll be able to once we kind of pin all that down, we'll be able to get a prototype, and then we'll run a campaign, a pre-order campaign to basically say you know how many people are interested in, and we'll also be able to know our exact manufacturing costs, you know minimum order quantity, mm -hmm. and that's what we'll put as our minimum for the pre-order, and then uh, and then be able to. Uh, you know, run that campaign. If it's successful, then we'll be able to manufacture the hardware. But the operating system will be pure OS, um, so it'll run a complete GNU Linux stack, or anybody who wants to run a GNU Linux on the computer or the phone, they would be able to as well. Oh, fantastic! And one of the one of the important discussion points with the phone, of course, is that anybody will bring up the baseband issue, mm. and uh, and even with Qualcomm recently trying to change their name from you know Qualcomm Snapdragon processor to Qualcomm Snapdragon platform. Uh, because uh, if anything, that's actually should we should probably have even adopt and use their terminology because it because by using the Qualcomm Snapdragon platform, what you're doing is all of the control is in that that platform. Uh, so we are not using a Snapdragon um, CPU, and we would actually separate the baseband uh, as a separate USB device. Mm -hmm. So that way, if you can completely disable it, if you want to have a Wi-Fi only device, and it will not actually have control of the entire phone, um, and you can enable it if you if you do want to have uh, a cellular service from a provider. And hardware, <clears throat> excuse me. And the phone will also have hardware kill switches for uh, the mic, the camera, the radios. Yeah. So the plan is to probably have three uh, Wi-Fi. Um, uh, Bluetooth as one, mm -hmm. and then camera microphone as another, um, and then the third would be um, uh, GPS. Uh, even though that's you know GPS is not an outbound, it's an inbound. But the by turning it off, meaning and then any apps that have access to the GPS chip would not have access to it. Um, and so, and then we might ha we might couple that one with um, uh, because we don't want to have just you know a litany of kill switches. If we can bundle them together to logical you know, um, uh, uh, switches, then that's probably what we'll end up with. So I think we're going to end up with three. Um, we're still kind of deciding on a few pieces there. Um, 
which is basically going to be, you know, how do we end up uh, modifying an, an existing case mm -hmm. to be able to do that? Yeah, of course, real estate and form factor are huge. Right, exactly. And so, um, but we're, we're, it'll probably be a, a five inch um, screen. So, uh, you know, in that range at least. So um, that, that does give us a little bit more uh, freedom to be able to do what we need with the hardware. Any talks with any carriers? Uh, or you're going to stick with your model of going straight to the consumers? So we're going to go straight to the consumers. These would be unlocked phones that they could actually walk in and get a SIM card for. Um, and so they would, uh, that's at least initially how we would go about doing it. The reason is because the business development aspect of partnering with carriers would be a tremendous undertaking for the size of the company we are right now, even though we're you know, growing quite rapidly. Uh, it's just that by being able to provide something for the user, then the user can decide, oh, you know, I can buy the phone, I can walk into any carrier and get a SIM card, or, um, uh, or they could opt to have it be a Wi-Fi only phone because uh, we're going to be also bundling together uh, you know, over the top or VoIP um, communication services, right? So encrypted communication services. So you can actually use your device on Wi-Fi only uh, without really any issue except when you're you know, not around a Wi-Fi connection. All right, so my blog is really geared towards non-techies. I want to make using encryption and digital privacy tools as easy as possible so that, you know, your grandma would feel comfortable doing it. Um, and there's kind of, you know, up to this point, there's kind of maybe one hurdle that would stop someone from like me from taking a purism, um, approach, uh, maybe two hurdles. Uh, first I have to convince my spouse to, uh, let me drop some money on new hardware. Um, and the second would be, and I've already confessed to you that I haven't used, uh, one of your, uh, laptops yet, but, Coming from a government background, of course, all they use is Windows, and then uh, I've had a MacBook for a while, um, and I've never been someone who uses Linux before. So if I am a straight vanilla, let's just say Windows user, what's the learning curve to switch over to using a Purism laptop? Right. Well, that's it's such a fantastic question, um, because I would say that that argument would have been actually something I'd worry about uh, maybe five years ago. The reason I don't worry about it now and people are um, buying our product without even really caring what the underlying you know kernel is, right? If it's a Linux kernel or if it's you know if run Windows or Mac OS. And the reason is because uh, smartphones have made it where it doesn't matter, right? As long as it works, then they're happy. So really the, the, the main thing it comes down to is convenience. Right, and that's what we focus on is is by making it really convenient. Then, when somebody opens it up, and if they're familiar with Windows, of course, Windows has also done us a huge favor by changing to really a completely unusable system now. Uh, and so, um, by them changing from what people were familiar with uh, to you know this tiling approach and this, right, it makes it where and then f the uh, people using phones where they will switch from iOS to um, you know, to Android, and they can change back and forth because basically the apps just work. Mm -hmm. And so, by having uh, a system when you open it up and you can, you know, have an email program and you have your web browser and you have, you know, when someone sends you a Word document, you can immediately open it, leave a writer, and edit it, save it, and send it back, and it all becomes uh, transparent, um, and uh, and you can easily communicate back and forth. So. Uh, what we've done is we've, we've, we understand that convenience is the end game. And by making a product that's really convenient for users to use, uh, then we know we can, we can easily win them over. So that's where somebody doesn't have to worry that, oh, you know, let's say, you know, back in the day that you, even, you would remember that when somebody at their office had, you know, Windows 95 and they need to have a certain version of Word and in the, you know, free software world, it would be, you know, well, we're running Star Office, and you know, okay, so it's fine. We can sort of communicate, but that was a big deal. Uh, that is not a big deal any longer, and that's one of the things that I've actually also pushed. Uh, and one of the big reasons we started Purism is because I also believe that the days of buying any type of hardware and installing your own software 
is not as convenient as getting a bundle. Uh, and so that's one of the things that by starting Purism is that we create that really convenient bundle. So you can just buy our hardware and you can literally open it up and just use it. And it all just works because it was the software is designed to run with the hardware. And the hardware is really, you know, uh, will last a long time. And so, so that is where we can actually compete with these proprietary large, you know, organizations that strip privacy and, you know, spy on users uh, for their, you know, uh, profit. So um, by competing head to head on the same business model principles, then we can actually leverage the dollars spent on our products to further advance the overall uh, convenience goal that we have, which is the same goal that you mentioned that you have on your blog and website. That's awesome. I'm sold. Uh, my next machine will definitely be a Purism laptop. And I'm really looking forward to the phone too. Uh, let me put you on the spot for a second. What phone do you use now and what operating system are you running? I, I, I do own a HTC. Okay. I run an Android. Um, and uh, however, I don't carry that around with me. I mm -hmm. have that really because my conversations with you uh, can actually be over uh, you know, a nice free software tool. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that's the case for everything else. Um, uh, I have run uh, CN Moigone, however you pronounce that. Uh, the Android port, mm -hmm. um, but I don't currently. I actually run um, the Android stock Android, and that also allows me to kind of test um, to see, you know, constantly, like, you know, just in a recent software update where you're literally, you know, it's like they're just owning your entire device. Yeah. Um, so uh, I usually use um, my laptop and VoIP tools, um, so I don't even carry my phone anywhere I go. Um, and but I do still have one. And once we actually put out our phone, then I can finally ditch the uh, the old uh, HTC Android. Good answer. Uh, about four months ago, I switched to um, Copperhead OS on a Nexus 5X. Um, yes. And I tried to stick completely open source. And then I eventually caved and I put a few proprietary apps on it. Like I love my Proton Mail. So, but um, sure. it's a, it's a good platform. I really like it. Um, anyway, th that was yeah. an aside. No, it's great. I mean, you know, so some of the benefits of what Copperhead OS has done, uh, and as well as even, um, uh, you know, with uh, uh, Subgraph OS, so and Cubes OS. So these are things that, as Pure OS, we're actually focusing on. You know, hey, what are the, some of the things that these organizations have done that are really great things that we can end up bundling together? Um, and so, uh, looking at Copperhead OS, looking at Subgraph OS. Looking at Cubes OS and and looking at the what things are good from them, but also still making it really convenient for a user and being able to bundle that in uh, together as uh, as a you know mobile distribution. One of the think really the toughest piece as it relates to the phone is actually not using anything that's Android derivative, right? Um, and uh, that's been taking us the longest amount of research. So on the hardware side, we have a couple choices. Um, uh, and we sort of pin that down much clearer now. On the software side, is we're still trying to really, you know, dig into what are all the tools that we're going to use uh, to have it be actually a true GNU Linux-based device. All right, fantastic. Well, I want to make sure that I respect your time. Uh, but before we go, where can folks find you personally, and where should they follow uh, Purism at? So we, we our website uh, is puri.sm. And uh, from there, of course, you can you know be able to reach out to me directly or to follow us on uh, any of the social media sites that we link to from there. All right, fantastic. I also wanted to say, um, I mean, obviously, I love the fact that you guys take Bitcoin. <laughs> so right. I try to shove Bitcoin into every conversation. It's probably good uh, that I didn't. Um, but uh, anyway, that's how I'll be purchasing mine so that there's no uh, digital trail. I'm not really tinfoil hat, but... You know, someday in the future, having a device that doesn't track you, that might be yeah. seen as subversive. So, <laughs> right. well, the thing that's funny about that, I mean, and so I, I'll touch on it since you brought it up. So, yes, of course, we take Bitcoin. We also uh, take a number of other forms of currency because the cryptocurrencies, because we are trying to, you know, expand to what people would want to use. But, um, and, you know, I'm also not one who, uh, who is on the fringe of thinking that you know everything is being monitored 
constantly. Mm -hmm. That's a, you know a negative for me. Um, obviously, you can be scooped up in a drag net, which we have been right. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I also believe that you know that even uh, governments, there's the left hand of the government and the right hand of the government, and so. Um, so I come about this as uh, as really that we should be able to own our devices and protect ourselves uh, as opposed to just leaving it open. And I, I like to use an analogy to, you know, to homes, which is that when, you know, because so, I'll hear from a lot of people who are like, I have nothing to hide. And of course, I flip that on the head and say, of course, no one has anything to hide. We all have just things we want to protect. And, the, and it's a misnomer to use the word hide as opposed to protect. And so the, the equivalent is, you know, would you want to install, you know, uh, webcams that the government can just use to monitor you or, uh, you know, leave your door unlocked and the front gate open? Um, and, you know, and, and if someone rummages through your, your drawers that you come home, and you're like, oh, it's no big deal, right? They're rummaging through my doors. Well, that same thing is, applies to uh, your, your physical rights should apply to your digital rights, and they don't today. And that's a big thing we're pushing for as well, is that... Um, just common practice of being able to protect yourself ends up allowing you to have freedoms, to be able to speak out, uh, to be able to, um, you know, uh, have the, your digital rights respected as well as your physical rights. And that's a big thing that I push for as, a, as an advocate uh, for uh, digital rights. Well, that's great. I mean, I don't think there's a political solution to this, so I think it's going to have to be a uh, technological solution, and I think it's going to have to be an industry norm and an industry standard, and you guys are leading the way on that. So I can't awesome. thank you enough. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I appreciate you coming on. It's fantastic. I'd, I'd certainly do it again. All right. Bye, Todd. Thanks. All right, All right. That was Todd Weaver from Purism. Great company. They're obviously on the right track with digital privacy and security. And uh, with that, I just want to say one more time, don't forget to check out our show sponsor. And if your device doesn't have a camera kill switch, then you probably need one of these silly little stickers. Uh, it's crazy that we have to do that, but we have them for sale on the CryptoTech Amazon store. You can find that link on our website. And um, yeah, put those on all your devices. And with that, I will leave you. Have a great week.